Hello everyone and welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4. It has been a very long time, unless you are uh, actually coming in later and watching through the series, in which case you are lucky because you did not have to suffer through a, I think at this point about four weeks break, while uh, I was busy moving house and getting set up in a new place. You might hear it, there's a little bit of a different audio going on, because the room is still quite empty. But uh, I am actually also trying to remember where we were. So I think uh, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time getting everybody up to speed. If, uh, again, you're watching this later, feel free to just skip ahead. But we have multiple flashpoints going on. So after the, uh, after the betrayal of, uh, of the United States of America under MacArthur, of our troops in, uh, in the Pacific, uh, we have switched sides and we're now supporting the American Union state. Uh, and uh, that is not that we're trying to make the American Union state win. We just want to make sure that the syndicalists don't, because uh, MacArthur's troops are getting squeezed quite heavily. The Pacific states have been expanding rapidly here, and uh, we just want to make sure that the syndicalists don't win. So right now uh, we are having a couple of tactical objectives here. Uh, I think the first one is to try and encircle a couple of divisions here, uh, and uh, try to wipe these out. We also need to deal with our supply situation. So uh, taking taking the province in the north here will help, uh, if we can manage, will help uh, connecting the railways. And we have a potential uh, vector towards Charlotte, although there's a river in between, so uh, probably not gonna be attacking from that direction. And we have the potential of uh, taking the, uh, the air base here in North Carolina because right now we are not having any uh, not having any planes in the air and uh, that means the enemy fighters are going pretty much uncontested which is not great so uh, that's our objectives in the united states in south america uh, things don't look too great in argentina because argentina is fighting a war on three fronts uh, they're fighting the they're fighting paraguay in the north uh, they are fighting chile in the west and they are fighting the Patagonian Workers' Front, which is supported by Chile in the south. Now, we have managed to uh, encircle some foreign troops here in uh, Valparaiso, but uh, they are turning out to be uh, relatively difficult to dislodge from here. So uh, we, we will uh, we'll do what we can, but we have to hold the, uh, the southern side here. So these divisions, this division here definitely needs to dig in. And I think once we've dealt with these, uh, I might actually redeploy... Uh, can we? Uh, I might try to redeploy either north and try to knock Chile out, or um, uh, try to uh, redeploy north and try to get Paraguay out of the out of the picture. And the answer to that is probably going to be in supply. Yeah, we do have supply. We do have supply lines on both sides that we can use. So. Uh, I don't know how much, uh, how many victory points Chile actually still has. Let's see if we can, uh, we can see that. Uh, where are we fighting? Uh, Paraguay, Argentina. It's probably this one, the Argentinian Chilean, Chilean War. So uh, Chile is about uh, forty-five percent towards capitulation. So if we are, if we were to take. Uh, if we are to take a couple of cities in the north plus their their capital, they might actually capitulate, and that'll free up uh, that'll free up a mu uh, much needed resources. But first, we need to destroy these troops here, and that is harder than it looks due to the fact that they're relatively experienced. They're dug in, and unfortunately, they have supply because they are getting uh, they're getting supplied over 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 sea. Uh, we also have the uh, Bulgarian volunteers uh, who are currently not doing an awful lot except holding the front lines simply because we are so outnumbered and uh, we only have uh, relatively weak infantry to work with. So as it stands, uh, we're not doing an awful lot here in this particular conflict. And in Asia, uh, things are getting interesting because the Russians have been starting to attack the Central Asian states. So we'll, we may send some troops if we can find a, a position that we can actually support. And uh, Germany, the German East Asia colony, is still trying to dislodge Indochina here in the south, which uh, uh, turns out to be a lot harder than it should be. But uh, at least uh, there are now troops in the water. 
So finally, they've started shipping the troops from uh, from the south, from uh, from Borneo, and hopefully they can make a landing near Saigon. That would be ideal. Uh, let's see where they're targeting. No, they're actually trying to land in uh, Nha Trang, that, which is okay. They're going to trying to get behind the enemy uh, troop lines here, and uh, if they can take that, uh, cut cut them off from supply, and then hopefully destroy them in the north. That would be that would be a worthwhile effort as well. So. Uh, things are happening. Japan is busy invading the Philippines, but hasn't uh, has, so far hasn't managed to uh, take Davao. And uh, where else was there trouble? Uh, I think India had trouble. So uh, the commune, uh, as long as the communists don't win, I again I am uh, quite happy with that. So uh, right now the, the syndicalists are fighting on two fronts against the princely federation in the south and the dominion of India in the north. And it looks like uh, after initial gains, they are not doing too well. So again, this is not something we're getting ourselves involved in. What are we building? Uh, we're still building up some civilian factories, but we are throwing military factories in here as well. Because while we are still suffering from, a, uh, from the vast public works debuff on factory output, uh, we are very, very short on all kinds of equipment, so that is definitely something uh, that is definitely something we need to fix. We also need to start producing AA, uh, and uh, we need to start producing more medium bombers. And the tanks that we're currently producing are absolutely atrocious. In that regard, let us actually take a look at the tank designs that we have. Uh, what kind of tank tech do we have? Let's ch let's check that out first. So right now. We have the 1936 light tanks, or we could do 1934 heavies. But uh, somewhat more advanced light tanks might not be bad. We could get a slightly improved light tank design, although with 1930, December 37, I'm almost feeling that we should probably be switching to the 1938 mediums and just uh, start getting these going, rather than investing further into light tanks. But uh, let's see what we could... Let's see what we could potentially build here or design here, because the current uh, tank designs that we have are terrifyingly bad. We have actually, this is an interwar tank, and the uh, Standard Panzer Kampfwagen 2, uh, we're not going to be doing that. We have the Heer Panzerwagen 2, the, an infantry tank, so a very, which is an interwar heavy. Uh, that, uh, that thing does 3.9 kilometers, yeah, that is absolutely terrible. So uh, that's no good. We don't kind of don't, can't really do anything with that either. And we have the uh, this could be Speepanzer Speepanzer 1 Ausführung A uh, of the basic light tank, which uh, with an armor of 17 is also pretty terrible. So if we were uh, if we were starting something on the improved light tank chassis, let's see what we could build here. So if we get a decent turret onto that um, and we get an improved small cannon, basically, that would be probably what we'd be working with here. Uh, just looking at soft attack mostly, but we have we have been um, we have been uh, we have been seeing a lot of we've been seeing a lot of tanks as well. So on the enemy side, so probably a more balanced layout is not a terrible idea. Uh, we do want to. Uh, now I'm just I'm just looking. I'm not probably going to build it just now. Uh, we have a gasoline engine which is fine. Uh, we probably want. <laughs> we can. We have makeshift armor. Okay, that is definitely not something we want. But uh, riveted armor is not great. So uh, let's see what let's see if we have what that would look like with welded. And uh, with a track suspension, we currently have bogey suspension. I think going up to Christie would be uh, would would be a good would be a good uh, intermediate value. That gets us a soft attack of fifteen. And in terms of special modules, there's not an awful lot we could throw in here. Sloped armor is quite expensive in terms of of XP. So uh, for a light tank, might not be that valuable. Uh, fuel drums is usually not a bad thing to add uh, for extra fuel capacity, especially if we're fighting in areas where there's not an awful lot going on. But uh, I am also more interested to see how far we can push uh, engine and armor up before the uh, uh, before the reliability is hitting rock bottom here, really. Um, 
what are we current uh, what's our current design in terms of uh 86 yeah so uh, th this would give us this would give us a noticeably better armor. Uh, Nine point one kilometers is still relatively reasonably fast, and uh, we can actually get that bumped up with uh, with the experience that we have from Henschel. So we could probably ten kilometers would be uh, ten kilometers would be nice, but uh, I think we'll, we'll I'd rather take the take the reliability here. So with that. Uh, unless we want to throw in, uh, we could throw in the wet ammunition storage, uh, which is uh, which gives us a bit of reliability, and that might allow us to throw the sloped armor in as well, because that would get the armor up to 45. So this should be reasonably safe from enemy light tanks, although I have doubts that this can stand up to enemy medium tanks. So. Um, um, not too certain yet that I still I do have light tank divisions at the moment, but um, uh, we do need to we do we do need to get ready for for a conflict. So I do need to spit out a lot of uh, a, a relatively large number of them, uh, and we also need aircraft. And aircraft is something we def desperately need. But uh, let's say somewhere between thirty and forty army XP would be a tank design that we could work with. Uh, what uh, because what we've got right now is is terrible. Uh, we have the BF one hundred and nine on the aircraft front, and I think research wise we are uh, where. What are we looking at? Uh, yeah, uh, basic uh, basic small airframes and basic medium airframes is what we're working with. So if we look at the designs, uh, what we have on the BF one hundred and nine uh, that is uh, that could potentially do with a. Um, oh, I don't have the I don't have the defense systems yet, do I? No. So we don't have the, the research yet for um, for getting self-sealing fuel tanks and similar. And we're currently running with uh, LMGs. And that is currently the best we have. So if we're looking at the research, this has all been changed a little bit. So I do have to, apologies, I do have to check that from time to time. Uh, we're still uh, we're still a year ahead of the heavy of the heavy machine guns and uh, this and the survivability study. So for now, as a just as a frontline fighter, potentially the only thing we could do would be uh, to the design would be to give it a bit more range. Because right now, uh, this thing's got a range of 500 kilometers, which is not great. And if we were to uh, throw drop tanks in there, however, that would impact uh, that would significantly impact its uh significant uh, extra fuel tanks would give us range but uh, uh that that's all comes at the cost so i think as a short range sort of national defense fighter this can kind of keep working and we're building the uh the heinkel he111 as a medium bomber which uh, has a range of 900 kilometer which is uh, which is a little bit more use a uh, little bit more usable and we haven't actually assigned a uh, an aircraft designer here oh because i probably didn't have the xp to do it now which aircraft designer have we actually uh, design company have we actually used we are currently using Donier for the production so it probably makes sense to uh, to assign Donier here as well and uh, this gives uh, uh, this is a medium aircraft designer, so uh, this is more focused on actual medium aircraft, so more specialized. So this this probably makes sense uh, to be using. So we could spend five uh, uh, five air XP here to get that added because right now I don't really have a need to um, to redesign anything unless we want to go for a unless we want to go for a close air support uh, plane. So if we go for the basic small airframe and uh, we would give this cast weapons. So if we added a uh, small bomb bay and potentially, uh, potential, uh, that's probably too heavy with the anti-tank cannon as well. Um, and that is, small bomb bay gives us, uh, gives us eight ground attack and the ca cannon gives us eight ground attack as well so we could as well go with two of those and then we would put a, a twin and uh, put a level two engine in here which would be enough but we don't really have uh, i think this is just this is, these are just for strategic bombing so that's not interesting 
and there's not an awful lot which gives us extend the range of these things which might not be a terrible idea and uh, or we could stick a we could uh, we could stick an, an LMG turret on it for a little additional defense so that would be that would be potentially and which one have we been using here I think we've been uh, who, who are we running on? We're running Focke Wolf on the fighters, so there's no there's no synergy here between them. So we'll have to check which one we would be using, but uh, that would be a close air support. But I don't currently have, and the range is the range is pitiful. I don't currently have the uh, I don't currently have the factories to do much here. I'm currently building more on the fighters, really. So I'm quite happy to start out with the uh, with the mediums for now. And then once we've got, we've built up a little bit more of our military factories, to get into the uh, to get into uh, into close air support, uh, that also means we can probably uh, just get the Heinkel on uh, on Donier, save that for five, and then we just need to uh, we just need to update that. But I think that was free, so there we go. And that's done and uh, that is up to date on the sea we are building the Elsass class and uh, the SMS Elsass and uh, we probably want all of them to uh, to join where are we going to where we're we going to deploy them uh, Schleswig-Holstein should do and we'll do the same with you and with you and we've got a couple of su and we've got a couple of submarines on production. Uh, they can, yeah. I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to just uh, to just deploy in the North Sea for now. And we've got the 1934 Zerstörer that uh, that we're building. Once we are actually filling out the, once we are actually filling out the uh, uh, the dockyards. So there's a fair amount of work going on here. These are still going to be. Uh, the Elsass class is going to be still until 1940, unless we can improve our efficiency here quite a little bit more. But uh, we are getting there. And uh, that gets us to the intelligence agency, where we are. I think we were planning to see if we could cause some mayhem in, in Russia. So uh, what do we currently know about, about Russia? Uh, we have a relatively good civilian intel. So we have a pretty good idea what they are doing, but uh, maybe we can start some, some trouble and uh, do some sabotage missions or similar. So let's see if we can infiltrate the civilian administration. And uh, where, is, where, are my, where are my operatives currently? So I've got, uh, I've got Giskes and Schmidt in, uh, in Russia. And where is uh, where's Jakobs? Where is he? Have I sent? Uh, I probably sent him. Yeah. Okay. So so he is he's up in the north where the syndicalists are. Okay. So the other two can uh, can complete that mission. So let's get that going. Uh, let's infiltrate the Russian civilian administration. So Giskis and uh, Schmidt, which means we are going to need to we're going to need to rebuild our internal networks afterwards. But we'll get to that. And uh, then. We can, I think, we've captured most of the things. Uh, let me have a brief look at my uh, decisions. Black Monday is still ongoing. We've got 90 days. Uh, we haven't really done anything with restructuring the army, and it is necessary because we are struggling to make anything happen. So our current infantry divisions, our Sturm Division, have a single artillery. And they have huge, pro huge amounts of problems uh, dealing with dealing with these dug-in divisions here. So for for any kind of offensive operations, they are not great. Uh, we are completely lacking, or well, we're lacking a lot of things. But we do have 87 naval experience, which means given that uh, that we are uh, that we are constantly training, uh, there was I think there should be uh, let's see, yeah, naval reform. Uh, we'll do that while we're at it. Uh, we've got the naval XP, and that'll uh, that'll increase our naval experience gain. So we'll do that. 
we can switch that around later on but yeah we do need to we do need to do something about the absolute lack of army high command uh, the the lack of uh, the lack of uh, of doctrine and everything else we are very very much not not prepared for war which brings us actually to the focus tree currently uh, we're expanding the kriegsschule the the, the war school which gives us 50 army XP and a research slot. I think the research slot is really valuable at this point. And uh, we, once I think once once this is finishing, I'm gonna I'm gonna head over to medium tanks potentially, and see if we can get an early start on the 1938 mediums. And uh, we do have a couple of economic uh, things to be uh, to be done here. We've got the Salzgitter Stahlwerke, which would be a good one to do. But we also desperately need to. Uh, uh, need to get uh, get uh, get into our military tree here because we still have the uh, where is it we still have the victors of the Weltkrieg which is still uh, costing us army experience naval experience air experience and the way to get rid of it would be the unrestrained warfare and in order to get to the unrestrained warfare we do need to get started on the uh, the Fronde. Uh, military reforms and given that it's almost 1938 I think uh, military reform is probably something we're going to get need to get to sooner rather than later uh, we are still battling it out with the British when it comes to control over Ireland trying to sway Ireland to our side uh, I actually don't know for how long that is still going on 108 days so it's not that long anymore about three months and a cookie and uh, we've got a couple of decisions here uh, to improve our uh, to improve our national uh, our national infrastructure and industry. But I think I was uh, trying to get a chief of army potentially. And who do we have here? Uh, we have an army reformer, Kurt von Hammerstein Eckward. Uh, that might actually not be terrible. Uh, or or back for army offensive and uh, what else we got organization not bad I could I could use I could work with uh, with Werner von Fritsch as well so uh, that's probably the next uh, focus we're going to be doing we've got the Gewerkschaft Deutscher Kaiser for uh, for construction speed and research so that's why we're focusing on industry uh, we are Okay, on manpower, we do need to get up to partial mobile. Oh, yeah, we need to get up to partial mobilization. That might actually be more important than getting a chief of army at this point. So, yeah, I'm probably going to hop over to partial, mo uh, partial mobilization just to get the uh, just to get 5% consumer good factories and to get the construction speed up. So that's 10% uh, for civilian and 20% for military. So uh, that is probably the next thing we do need to do. Given that the overall situation in the world very much smells like we're going to be at war with put, definitely with the, commu uh, with the syndicalists, so with Britain and Fra France, uh, potentially with Russia as well. So things will get quite interesting there very quickly indeed. But for now, we are going to focus on... Uh, these two conflicts because these are the two that are that are burning so let me just um, let me just see if uh, if we've got the shortcut set up uh, so we've got the union volunteers and the argentinian volunteers okay so this one is the more critical one right now so uh, let us where, where's our air force here uh, we should have yeah we should have green air so we should have aerial superiority um is that the same air zone? That is the same air zone. We should have aerial superiority here, but uh, seems not to be the case. Anyway, uh, this division needs to recover, and uh, we will slowly up. We're defending here. Uh, hopefully, they can. Uh, they 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 should be able to hold that. Uh, they're being attacked from multiple directions. No, but they should be able to hold that uh, while we are recovering a bit uh, from the attack here in the north. And we are probably going to uh, start throwing them in quite quickly again, uh, just to keep the keep the assault going. And here we are, uh, here we are pushing north for for in, uh, for the supply, and we are pushing, 
and we are pushing uh, east to encircle these divisions there and destroy them. Uh, Erich Ludendorff has died. Newspapers in Munich report that Erich Ludendorff, the mastermind of the third OHL and the second in command of Paul von Hindenburg during the final years of the Weltkrieg, passed away from liver cancer yesterday. While Hindenburg, who died three years ago, is almost universally revered as a master tactician and savior of Germany in its darkest hour to this day, Ludendorff's legacy is far more controversial. His military ability is unquestioned, yet he is seen as a puppet master of the authoritarian military regime that took control of Germany by the end of the Weltkrieg. In 1920, trying to stop the parliamentarization process, he attempted to threaten Willem II one last time, yet as his servant, as his services were no longer necessary and his, superior, and his superior Hindenburg made a deal with the parliamentary reformists to keep the power of the army untouched, Ludendorff was forced to resign in disgrace. Since then, he remained a looming shadow over the German far right, yet even those who revered him began having second thoughts once he got involved. Once he got involved with the neo-pagan folkish fringe under the influence of his wife Matilde. His eccentric conspiracy theories and doubling into hystericism ultimately led to him being ignored by the far-right politicians who wished to present themselves as respectable. Regardless, he will be given a state funeral which will be attended by surviving members of the entourage as well as the royal family. And 1% bell stability. Oh yeah, stability is something we also need to deal with. We've got 40% stability, which is terrible. Um, yeah, so uh, that is actually a good uh, a good uh, segue to talk a little bit about uh, about where von Schleicher sees himself. So right now, um, right now, uh, the cabinet Schleicher holds twenty five percent of uh, of the popular vote at this point, but uh, the Deutsche Vaterlandspartei, so the far right extremists, where uh, people like Ludendorff, and that's where these sort of esoteric ideas like Thule Gesellschaft and similar things uh, would, in a different timeline, have ended up as well. Uh, these guys are still there, and uh, they, they, are, uh, they are relatively strong in Prussia and uh, causing us trouble from time to time. And we have the left wing as well under the SPD. And the SPD, as much as von Schleicher is the red general, so somebody who builds bridges between the uh, the, extra, the more extreme left and right wings of the political spectrum, uh, as much as he's somebody who supports both sides. Right now, the left are the ones who are causing us a lot more problems because of ongoing rebellions, because of sub uh, syndicalist subversion controlled by, uh, by the French and the British, and because uh, the SPD itself is rebelling to a degree and saying there is no threat to Germany. And that is just a that is such a blatant disregard for for the reality that we are heading towards a second Weltkrieg that uh, we cannot just we cannot just keep supporting these people in the name of building bridges across the whole spectrum. At this point, they will have they will either have to see that under threat from multiple directions abroad, the German Empire either has to strengthen, or it has or it will perish. Or they have to be they have they will have to be seen as enemies of the state, and uh, it's not that von Schleicher wants to go to a, uh, to a more right wing militaristic Germany in in Ludendorff's in Ludendorff's image, but uh, he he does not really honestly have much of a choice at this point than to to take the SPD not that seriously anymore as a political faction that is actually in support. Of the Kaiser and of the end of the German Empire as it currently stands, so if we don't want uh, the empire weakened to the point by by denialism to the point that uh, there'll be easy pickings for uh, for the syndicalists, then uh, we will have to naturally move a little bit more on the to the right in our domestic poli uh, politics. Anyway, uh, so uh, that's done. Um, we currently don't want to do any of these. And uh, we are uh, two and third. Uh, we're twenty points ahead of the British, so that's good. And we are still running the peace summit here, and we're ninety-three days away from from that, so that still has time. All right. So uh, biggest problem right now 
uh, is is our attempts here at breaking these divisions in Valparaiso because uh, that is uh, turning out to be a lot uh, a lot easier said than done and uh, we'll obviously we'll let them dig in the more we wait the tart circle uh, tart the tart the action in order to mobilize the masses in this day and age influential allies in the media are indispensable as the democrats and rightists have shown us in recent years as a non-partisan military man, Schleicher unfortunately lacks the far-reaching crucial media support, with the help of the so-called Tat Circle uh, that is now going to change. The editorship of the Berlin-based monthly journal Die Tat, The Action, has been a stalwart ally of Schleicher's political vision for quite some time. In fact, it played a crucial role during the fateful weeks in spring 1936, during which the magazine acted as a powerful opinion leader in the media campaign that eventually uh, resulted in Schleicher's controversial appointment as Reichskanzler. Extremely popular in intellectual patriotic youth circles, Die Tat aims for the reversal of the March Constitution order and the installment of a non-partisan charismatic leader who is able to synthesize the best components from both the left and the right into an entirely new ideology, German Socialism or Nationaler Sozialismus. According, uh, according to chief editor Hans Serer, all existing parties have been deeply corrupted by liberal currents and only the creation of something entirely new will be able to strengthen the German Volksgemeinschaft in its struggle against syndicalism and uh, Zawinkovism. That would be the Russians. Of course, Schleicher's Querverbindung ideas and his close cooperation with the trade unions, no matter which ideology, fit well into that agenda. During the past month, the young and charismatic Zera has closely worked together with Schleicher to advise him on domestic and foreign political affairs. The symbiosis between Die Tat and the Reich Chancellery might now grow even closer. Zera and his colleagues have recently acquired the formerly Christian conservative newspaper Tägliche Rundschau, the uh, daily review, you could say, uh, and are now planning to transform it into one of the most important propaganda flagships for the government's vision. While Die Tat will continue to appeal especially to an intellectual audience, Die Rundschau has to be the paper for the masses. So I, I literally just talked about it, but there are some interesting currents here. And uh, the sort of, I mean, national socialismus or national socialism, we, uh, we've, heard of, we've heard that one before. And uh, Schleicher is a military man. And now there is, we're starting to see an intellectual underpinning for his ideas of a powerful Germany, which includes, which is inclusive both to the, the, the masses on the left, so not the, not the politics on the left, so not the SPD or, or any of these parties, but uh, the people on the street with the trade union inclusion, as well as the right with um, more of a uh, you know, nationalistic approach and, and a patriotic approach using, uh, using the conservative newspaper that they've taken over. So uh, yeah, we, we, was, we can see where this is leading. And uh, while this is obviously von Schleicher's doing, it is also to a degree the doing of his political opponents by uh, being as obstructive and destructive towards the, the nation as they are. So you could even, you could even argue that if you, have, uh, if you have multiple political currents in a country that are pulling into completely different directions, are not capable of compromise and, uh, and are... Uh, are so extreme that they at some point actually end up threatening uh, threatening the nation as a whole, you might end up with a new current coming out from, from the grassroots that basically says, look, we are tired of these politics today. We want a nation that is very different. And if you're, if you're lucky, you get something good. But if you're not lucky, you might pick up some uh, propaganda means that allow these kind of grassroots... Uh, these kind of grassroots organizations to flourish, uh, which may end up with a country or a, a national structure afterwards that um, you didn't quite know you wanted. So I find this highly interesting and very well written. But what does this give us? 10% uh, popularity in authoritarian democracy, 5% base uh, stability, retire, for, retire Alfred Hugenburg, retire Wolf. And we can now get Zera, which gives us 5% uh, 5% political power and 10% stability. 
okay so uh, uh, we don't have we don't have either we don't have any of these people but who were they so uh, it retires uh, Alfred Hugenburg that would be the nationalist press baron who is uh, not as good and uh, we are retiring uh, Theodor Wolf which would be a liberal press baron so this would be the far right or the, the more conservative right I think we are starting to become the far right here very quickly. Uh, this would be the uh, this would be the left, and uh, instead we are getting uh, we're making Zera available. Zera, it would be great if he would if he would just be put in power, but um, I think I might have to spend 150 political power, which I don't have. So uh, we're going to, but yeah, uh, it gives us five percent base stability, which is great. We are now at 49. And uh, I might have to refresh that. So let's open that again. And uh, yeah, they are gone. And that means Hans Zera, Schleicher's mouthpiece. 10% uh, stability, 10% war support. And the uh, cabinet Schleicher has now, th has now 35% support in, in, uh, in the nation. So we are starting to also politically uh, politically take over so uh, lots of politics going on but uh, relatively little in terms of military progress happening here i might actually have to stop these kind of piecemeal attacks uh, as much as I, as much as i dislike giving them a chance to uh, giving them a chance to um to to dig in and recover but uh, uh, we'll let our divisions we'll let our divisions recover a little bit and uh, and then we will start uh, we'll start assaulting them again in force here once uh, once we have once we have recovered a bit uh, have we and we have covered uh, a Dutch operative uh, Gottfried Leekstra uh, yeah we have ways of making you talk definitely um, we actually have a bit of command power now so I was thinking of getting the chief of, I think of chief of army actually. Yeah, I think um, XP might be, uh, especially the doctrines are scaring me, that, or the luck, the, the absence thereof. So I think uh, we are going to get a quote from Hammerstein, uh, Hammerstein Eckward, which, allows, uh, which would allow us to, uh, to build up uh, army XP quite quickly. And uh, Ludwig Beck is also an interesting, uh, let me see, is, is he one of my generals? No, so I think uh, I think right now, uh, quote von Hammerstein Eckward would be the best choice, just because he will he will boost uh, army XP gain quite a bit. But I think we can because we've got twenty nine command power. I think we can um, we can give uh, no model doesn't have anything interesting, but uh, uh, Hammerstein Eckward does. So he could get the aggressive assaulter for 10% breakthrough. I think that's something, given that we only attack here, is actually going to help us. So we'll do that. And then this can recover until we are at 100, 100 points. And then that's all good. Uh, moving on uh, back to Argentina. Uh, the biggest problem I have is, is time as well, because Argentina is, yeah, they're breaking out here in the north already. Uh, Argentina is falling apart relatively quickly. So we need to we need to finish this off. I think I am going to uh, just attack with all four divisions at this point, and uh, we'll just keep an eye and see if they are. Uh, yeah, they're they're instantly counterattacking. So we'll have to break off the southern division. Have to hold here, but I think we now we now probably have enough momentum to make that happen. A Treaty of Riyadh. Okay, uh, let's have a quick look over into the Middle East and see what's going on there. Um, not that I am certain what they were even fighting for. So uh, the Russians are still pushing, but uh, I'll, I'll let them do that. But, uh, we are we are making progress here slowly, and in Argentina, okay, we are stuck again. And yes, we breaking breaking in circle uh, breaking entrenchment in the south means we're immediately being counterattacked. So. Uh, if we can, if we can break one of these, yeah, we've now got the the aerial superiority. But if we can break one of these divisions, uh, even just one, if we can manage to to de-org one of these divisions, 
and uh, get it destroyed, then that would be a massive uh, that would be a massive uh, bonus. Okay, we are uh, we are almost through in the north. Uh, we are holding. Oh, we we have managed to. Okay, we've managed to take the position here. So uh, this base should now be connected. Once the yeah the railway is being connected, uh, we're holding against the counter attack. And it looks like uh, Charlotte is being attacked. So we can take that supply supply hub here as well, if we want to, or we can use the momentum to push further north and disrupt the uh, disrupt the railway connections here. But um, uh, we are making our way uh, we are making our way through here. I do have to keep a little bit of an eye. Okay, we've managed we've managed that. Um, and we are now having these divisions encircled, which means uh, these guys, I'm going to assign them here. And I am not kind of not inclined. Do I need one division to help out here? Because we are on the defense here. And I'm not sure if that one division is going to be enough to take on these two encircled ones. Should be, because they're out. They're pretty much out of um, out of everything. I could keep pushing north, or we could assist with the assault on Charlotte. I think we are going to assist with the assault on Charlotte to to take to consolidate the lines here. Let's see what that will look like. It is across a river line, so it's less than ideal, but uh, it widens the front and it gets our divisions in, and that should help. Uh, that should help with. Uh, that should help with. Uh, uh, that should help with taking this this vital supply hub. Now, was Argentina looking? Okay, uh, we are holding. Yeah, we've once again. Uh, we'll send the two assault divisions in. Uh, try to wear down. Uh, try to wear down at least one of them. And here uh, we are holding the north. We are destro currently destroying these divisions here, and we are making our way into Charlotte. Uh, although here uh, the fight. Oh, they are force attacking here now. Uh, to to once again dis, uh, disconnect our uh, our lines here. So uh, let's see if we can hold this uh, force attacks are difficult to hold, uh, can be difficult to hold against. But uh, we should be able to take down one of these divisions here. And yeah, we're holding for now. Uh, we're taking Charlotte, Argentina. We are uh, we are still struggling uh, to try and get. Uh, I'm again going to help from the south and hope that they are not counterattacking. <laughs> We're still struggling to try and get these divisions destroyed here. But uh, yeah, we will... Oh, the Argentinians ha have broken north and I think uh, Chile is not in a good shape. Uh, we may be able to actually start... How far is Chile? Um, uh, Chile is 60% towards capitulation. So they have moved their capital there. Okay, so they've we've still got still got a couple of victory points in the north, but Argentina might be able to get to walk through here. Uh, so probably we'll redeploy here, destroy this Chilean division once we're done here, and uh, and then we are. I think we've I think we've almost got it. So uh, we'll throw everything in it. Yeah, I think we've got them, and. Uh, how does it look in the north? Oh, we were we were pushed back in the north. Okay, that sucks. Um, Charlotte can wait. We need to reinforce the lines here and uh, make sure that this wasn't in vain. Uh, that we have to hold about that counterattack. Okay, 1938 budget vote, and I think that's where we can end the episode. Uh, what's going on at home? According to the Imperial Constitution, the annual budget of the German Empire was proposed by the Imperial Government and approved by the Reichstag and the Bundesrat. Each item on the budget had to be discussed separately, allowing the parliamentarians to lodge direct criticism towards government policies. With the Enabling Act eroding away standard parliamentary procedure and, resulting, and reducing the ability of the Parliament to control the Reichskanzler's actions, the democratic opposition, opposition parliamentarians, which now include many SPD, LVP and left-wing Centrum deputies, expected to use the budget vote to hitch like a heart. In the, Bundes, in the Bundesrat, similar pl plans were being crafted by a bloc of opposition-aligned states. The Reichskanzler was aware of these plans. This is what I've been talking about. They're still not understanding the danger that the empire is in. 
Uh, the Reichskanzler was aware of these plans. After discussing the matter with his clique of advisors and informing the Kaiser of his plans and receiving his green light, after a short discussion, you see the Kaiser is actually the head of state, he announced something unexpected, stating that the stability and national security of the empire depends on the steady funding for the government apparatus without it being bogged down with parliamentary debates. He invoked the Enabling Act to approve an emergency budget for 1938, even though pretty much everyone understood that there was nothing emergency about it. The news caused an uproar. Accusations of power grabs and imposition of dictatorship and enormous protest. Thousands of German citizens took to the streets of the major cities. However, most of the protests were support, su suppressed by mobilized police and military units. The last vestiges of power are slipping away from the grasp of the old institutions. And unfortunately, that costs me 5% stability that I just har that I just regained. So, um, slightly, I mean, it, it would be nice to discuss things. But uh, as we can see, uh, von Schleicher's cabinet is now, uh, is now starting to uh, rapidly approach a majority. And the other parties are basically marginal being marginalized here. It would have been nice to try and get everybody on board, but I think Schleicher has for, for the longest time tried to get everybody on board. And he is done playing nice. And uh, he is doing away with things that get in his way. So, uh, the situation in the north, not ideal. Um, we are going to have to, we are going to have to reinforce here if we can and try to destroy these syndicalist troops here because that that is, after all, uh, I am really not getting there. I think we'll do that next episode because the, la the next thing that happened is the division among the left. The leadership of the democratic opposition has been under hard attack from the far left lately. Publications by KAPD and KPD aligned papers have highly criticized their position, claiming that they lacked the military the militancy <laughs> necessary to defend Germany from the emergence of yet another reactionary dictatorship. Well, you don't have any Germany anymore if you don't uh, you don't build a stronger a stronger nation here. Um, social democratic and liberal leaders, fear, fearing a threat to the leadership of the democratic movement, have responded in kind, attacking the socialists and syndicalists for their uh, for their ceaseless call for division among the anti-reactionary front. All in all, it has been very good work. Uh, has been a very good week for us. The Democrats have weakened their position significantly. And that has get us 2% stability back. They fight among themselves. Yes, exactly. Uh, because each of them has a different idea and their enemy is not the French or the British or the Russians, all of whom are plotting to do the downfall of the empire. These people just don't realize that we're on the verge of another world war. Instead, they're, they're, they're only interested in their own machinations, in their own power games, and uh, in, uh, in their own ways of, of uh, getting the empire to work the way they want it to. And in that, they've actually weakened themselves. And we are now really close to 40%. Anyway, it is a dark road that von Schleicher is, is treading here. And uh, for, the price will have to be paid at some point. But uh, given that we're fighting all over the world, and... Uh, uh, the threat that syndicalism is posing to everyone, I think, uh, well, it's probably the only road that von Schleicher can take. And that's it for me today. Thanks, everybody, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.